Okay, folks, so welcome. It's week 12 of 14, folks. We're racing towards the finish line. Um, let me see here. Any announcements? Not really. Let's see here. I hope you guys had a good three-day break. And um, what we're going to be doing today, folks, is we're continuing with our um, introduction to viruses PowerPoint. And then, folks, we'll start, um, we're just going to do two RNA viruses today, influenza viruses, and a little bit on polio viruses. Because the Monday, Wednesday um, section lost a lecture this week, folks, I don't think we're going to go over HIV in detail. <laughs> but instead, what I'll do is I'll make an HIV worksheet, and we'll have um, some, some um, HIV-type questions as bonus questions on our lecture exam three. Okay, so I'll, I'll get an HIV AIDS uh, worksheet together. And again, um, any new information that's on that worksheet, information we haven't discussed yet about HIV, would be bonus questions on lecture exam three. So I'll ha hopefully have those on um, Thursday. So then, folks, um, Thursday our plan would be Thursday our plan would be to um, finish up the last little bit of viruses and um, talk about prions. And possibly, if we have time, we'll start the next unit, medical microbiology. And the reason for that is, is because the Thanksgiving holiday is coming up. We're going to miss a lecture because of Thanksgiving. So if we can get a little bit ahead, that would be awesome. Okay, you guys. So we're back to the last, um, last bits, last slides of our introduction to viruses. We are on um, just, I don't, I, I'm not even sure we got there to slides 55. And this was looking at some of the clinical signs of uh, the human herpes virus type 1 and type 2 infections. We are saying that the human herpes viruses um, are, as, as one professor put it, like diamonds, because the herpes viruses like to cause these lifelong latent infections. So we are saying that when we're first infected, initially infected, usually, well, often we'll have clinical signs and symptoms um, the viruses cause a lytic infection, so we'll have these very painful, fluid-filled um, blisters um, at the sites of infection. Common sites are the mouth, the face. Um, um, we can get them on the finger, especially if you're involved in dentistry, and, and also we can have genital tract infections, right? And following the, the clinical course, the um, lesions will resolve, and we might feel like, oh, we're cured, right? We're not going to suffer from that anymore. But we want to remember, you guys, with the type 1 and type 2 um, human herpes viruses, they invade the sensory neurons, and they travel up the sensory axons, and the viruses are, are remaining dormant in the sensory neurons in the, the cell body. And for reasons we don't totally understand, there'll be triggers that will reactivate the virus, it will descend back down the sensory um, neuron axon and then reinvade the epithelial cells um, where the sensory neuron invades. So we get these reactivations. It can, it can um, happen frequently. Usually the older we get, the more frequent they might become because we know certainly having a good, strong immune system helps to keep the viruses in, um, in check. So these are just some examples, folks. And this is, this is kind of a classic um, oral herpes lesion. Now, this might be the initial infection, or it could be reactivation, right, of the um, herpes infection. Um, this is really troubling, you guys. This is called herpes gladiatorum after the Roman gladiators, you know, who were wrestlers, you know, and fighting. And so folks that are involved in high-contact sports are at <laughs> risk for infection with herpes viruses because probably any kind of trauma to the skin or mucous membranes is a great entry port for the viruses. And certainly folks like wrestling or MMA, something like that, there's a lot of trauma. If their opponent is shedding virus, that's a great way for them to get infected. And what's, to me, really disturbing folks here is the infection of the eyes. Um, because with reactivation of the herpes virus, this can lead to damage to the eye. They can contribute to scarring and blindness of the eye, which to me is really troubling. Um, and here's, here's an example. This could either, again, be initial or reactivation. This is called herpetic whitlow. This is an occupational hazard of folks involved in dentistry. Um, because if, if someone is shedding herpes from the mouth, let's say I'm shedding herpes from my mouth, and I don't know it yet. I don't have any clinical signs or symptoms, so I don't know I'm shedding. And I go to the, the dentist, the dental hygienist in 
cleaning my teeth, those sharp instruments can poke through the gloves, right, and cause damage. And then if I'm shedding the virus in my saliva, the virus can infect um, the finger. So um, we get those painful fluid-filled lesions on the finger. And in hand folks, what's so bad is that once you're infected, you're, you're infected for life, right? And so um, the viruses can reactivate later. And certainly, guys, if you're working with your hands, right, your hands are so <coughs> sensitive, right? There, there's so many sensory ne neuron innervations there. I can't imagine trying to be a dental hygienist or a dentist, you know, and I have this reactivation going on. And indeed, you'd also be worried about infecting new patients, right? Because these, these fluid-filled vesicles are filled with infectious herpes virus. And then genital herpes, folks. We said that if the virus has read the textbooks, if the virus has read the textbooks, the human herpes viruses will know that type one um, human herpes viruses should infect above the belt and type two below the belt. But you guys, we always remind ourselves, do viruses read our textbooks? They don't, right? So it's really important that we educate our patients in that a type one herpes infection or a type one herpes virus can be spread to the genitals and vice versa. That's really important. Yeah. So I know when I get like full sores, it takes glycine and stuff like that. I know. Does that work yeah. the same way? Like Th this, I don't know. And you guys, that would actually, I always use this on you guys. What a great extra credit project that would be. Because several people have said that, that lysine should help with reactivation. Mm -hmm. But I don't know the mechanism. I don't know why lysine would work. So if anybody's interested in that, you know, that might, that might be of interest. Um, certainly, <laughs> folks... Um, there are antiviral medications you can take. They won't cure the herpes infection, but what they can do is re reduce the number of reactivations. They can reduce viral shedding, right? So slow down the virus. So um, like potentially like for me, you guys, if I went to the dentist and I'm on uh, maybe an antiviral drug, um, I'm not shedding as many viruses, right? And certainly it's supposed to reduce the period and duration of incredible pain because these, these I, I, I've got them, you guys, I got, I got my, little, my little pet herpes hanging out up here in my trigeminal gang, ganglion. And whenever it reactivates, it's very, very painful. Yeah, okay. And then, folks, um, uh, another topic that's really important with uh, human herpes virus type 1 and type 2 is neo neonatal herpes. And... Um, my understanding is, like, we're most worried about our pregnant patients who, who very recently have first become infected with, uh, um, with a, um, a genital tract infections with uh, herpes viruses because mom hasn't had a chance to make pr protective maternal antibodies. Mom can make antibodies, IgG antibodies, that will cross the placenta and circulate in the baby's um, tissues. So that if, if, say, there's a vaginal delivery and mom is shedding, right, from the vaginal mucosa, the baby ends up kind of getting bathed in potentially these herpes viruses. But if baby has mom's maternal antibodies circulating, that might really decrease the chance that the baby's going to have a serious infection. But if mom ha hasn't had a chance to develop antibodies, right, do a vaginal delivery, mom shedding herpes, the, the baby is um, infected, the baby's immune system is really immature. You know, even at, ter at term babies, their immune system is immature. And the viruses can spread throughout the body, um, can invade every tissue, every organ, including the central nervous system. And depending, probably you guys, on the, th these mortality rates, what a, what a range, right? They're saying here that neonatal herpes, it can be life-threatening with 30 to 80% mortality rates. That's, that's a huge range, right? That means out of every 100 babies infected, 30 to 80 of them will die. And I'm wondering, you guys, if that does reflect the immune status of the mom, right? Maybe it's lower mortality when, again, mom's had a chance to make antibodies pass to the baby. Maybe higher mortality, again, when mom hasn't had a chance to make those protective antibodies. And then, folks... Um, if you look at the um, in neonatal herpes, a, a lot of times people would presume, well, it's most likely going to be the human herpes virus type 2, right, the genital tract infection. But some cases of neonatal herpes are from type 1. And you're, you, you're, like, you're trying to figure that out, and you're like, okay, well, it could be mom had a type 1 genital tract infection. Or, you guys, this is really important, and I need to repeat this every, every time, 
Um, what if there's a newborn baby and say grandma who's shedding herpes from the mouth, you know, is holding the baby and what is our instinct? We want to kiss them, right? Kiss them everywhere. Right? But if if grandma is shedding herpes in the saliva, could could grandma be a source to infect the baby? Yeah. And so this is really important, you guys. It it you can imagine this could get really tough because if grandma or granddad or uncles or aunts come in and there's obviously an active herpes lesion going on, you're like, don't touch the baby, right? I mean, this can get kind of tricky. So education is important. Just kind of, how should I say this, you guys? I was thinking, you know, maybe one way, if, if you have maybe a loving family member and they're offended, say, let's just make it a rule we only kiss the baby's toes, right? And then we wash their feet right afterwards. But this is something for us to, to remember, you guys, is that newborn babies are, are really highly vulnerable to all kinds of infections. Yeah, Christina. I was just wondering, what is that on the back of your hair? Oh, gosh, you guys. So, like, this little, this little hole? Yeah. Gosh, you guys, you know what? I was presuming it was just like a roll of skin. Is that, am I wrong? AMP folks, help me out. <laughs> Boy, you can, you can see why I don't teach anatomy. You think it's just skin, maybe yeah, like just like from the it kind of like that, yeah, yeah. Right. So in the baby, you guys again, they, they can have cutaneous, you know, the skin, ocular eye, and central nervous system infections, and again, can be can be really devastating. All right, and then folks, we're gonna um, go to just another. A uh, relatively common herpes virus family, and that's the chickenpox shingles. I think we talked about this, also known as varicella zoster. So, folks, um, with chickenpox, usually we, uh, how should I say it? Let me back up. So, um, if as a child, say, you, you got infected with chickenpox, you, there's a good chance you got infected through infectious respiratory secretions of maybe a playmate, right? Because in chickenpox, the first infection, we are shedding the chickenpox virus in our respiratory secretion, so sneezing, coughing, right? And so the initial portal is the respiratory mucosa, but then the virus becomes viremic, it, it's in the blood, and then it spreads throughout the body. And it's like almost like the second stage where we see the classic chickenpox vesicles, and again, you guys, lytic infection, Right, so the, um, the fluid within those pox, those vesicles, is chock full of, inf of infectious chickenpox virus. So that's another way you can get infected, right? Is coming into contact with somebody that's actually shedding the virus from those vesicles, yeah? And so here, folks, this is the, the, first, the first infection then with the varicella zoster is the chickenpox, is varicella. But remember, you guys, we have the same phenomenon in that the viruses are going to invade the sensory neurons. And again, same, same story, you guys. They hang, they hang out in the um, ganglia, the collection of neurons. And then um, on trigger, and very often we say it's with old age, right? As our immune system starts to decline, we can get reactivation of the, um, of the virus. And then it travels back down the sensory neurons and reinvades the epithelial cells, right? where those sensory neurons are invading. Now, this reactivation is called what? Shingles. It's not a new infection. It's just a reactivation. And furthermore, you guys, I didn't think about this, but in shingles, again, we have a lytic infection, so we can have the fluid-filled vesicles. That fluid is chock full of infectious virus. So in shingles, like if I, if I break with shingles, you guys, like the, I could cause infection of you if you came in contact with the viruses in those, in those lesions, but I'm not shedding it by the respiratory route. So we could say that shingles is gonna be less contagious, right, than the chicken pox when you're actually shedding in your respiratory secretions. Does that make sense? Oops, okay, yeah. Now, the, the good news is, is that they now have vaccines to, have to try to either prevent the initial infection, to try to prevent chickenpox, or in any case, maybe the vaccine isn't 100% of preventing infection, but certainly, again, we're gonna reduce replication, reduce spread, reduce the length of the initial clinical signs and symptoms, right? Maybe reduce the pain associated. So there's a lot of us, though, that 
that um, were infected with chickenpox as kids, a relatively common childhood disease. So what I think fortunate folks is for, for us, those of us that have um, the chickenpox virus hanging out in our sensory neurons, they do have a, um, a shingles vaccine. And again, you guys, it's not going to cure us. But the whole thought is, is, is to reduce the duration of reactivation, reduce the pain, right? Maybe it will help reduce viral shedding as well, right? So there's a chickenpox vaccine and a shingles vaccine. But, but folks, this is, to me, this is a really important concept, and, and for sure I'll ask it on lecture exam too. These, the uh, chickenpox and shingles vaccine, are described as live attenuated viral vaccines. So we really want to uh, explore this concept. So why, I'll put that in parentheses, attenuated. Attenuated means to weaken. So this whole concept, folks, of attenuation, the process was developed by Pasteur. And Pasteur was trying to develop a vaccine against rabies, and rabies is a viral pathogen. So his, his goal was to develop a rabies vaccine. And back in the 1800s, you guys, if you got bitten by a rabid animal, you were probably going to die for sure, right? And so uh, Pasteur, what he did was he took the rabies virus and he passed the rabies virus from an infected dog, I, I believe, through um, rabbits. And so what he would do is he would infect a rabbit and then the, the rabbit would develop clinical signs or symptoms. A rabid rabbit. I would be afraid of a rabbit rabbit if I was camping. Oh, anyway, right? And then he would sacrifice the rabbit and he would harvest the, um, the spinal cord, right, where the viruses were replicating. I think he would dry the spinal cord and then use that dried spinal cord to inoculate more another rabbit. And he kept doing this generation after generation after generation. And some people think that what happens is, is the rabies virus is adapting to this new host. Like rabbits aren't the perfect host for rabies viruses, but through mutation and natural selection, they, there, there will be mutants that, that, that can replicate better in the rabbit, right? So we could argue that there's um, selection for these weakened rabies viruses. Right, they're not as virulent. So we would say they're attenuated. So they have low or no virulence. They've lost the ability to cause damage, even though they can still cause infection, now they're not going to cause the damage that we associate with um, fatal um, rabies infections. So the, the story is that, that Pasteur, I think, was a pretty ethical person, and he didn't want to run any human studies on this, because it's like, well, I, I, I think he used it like to protect dogs. Um, I'm not sure if he used it to vaccinate rabbits, but he had some animal data that suggested that it could protect against rabies, but he didn't want to try it on humans, right? How would you challenge, right, if you vaccinate the human and say, now we're going to have a rabid dog bite you, right, and see if the vaccine works. But the story, I think, folks, is that there were two children that were bitten by either a rabid dog or rabid wolf, and there had been enough press that the, the, the um, general public knew that, that Pasteur was working on this vaccine. So in desperation, the families brought the children to Pasteur and pleaded with him, you know, please, please, you know, see if you can vaccinate. Maybe your vaccine somehow by a miracle will, will protect our children after they've been bitten. And so he, he did agree to do it because he knew the little kids were going to die otherwise. And you guys, it was amazing. It worked. So this is even more phenomenal, you guys. So this is, this is described as post-exposure post vaccination, meaning after you get infected, right, then you get vaccinated. And it's possible, folks, that, that the reason that vac vaccinating somebody that's been bitten by a rabid animal, vaccinating after they've been bitten works, it might be because the virus first replicates locally, wherever the bite is. And you guys are going to laugh at me, but it's like if you're ever being attacked by a rabid rabbit, no, a rabid dog, you, if you have to get bit, you want it as far away from your brain as possible. So you guys, seriously, you know, you'd be trying, if you're not running away, but kicking, right? 
You don't want to get your head down there because the closer the bite wound is to your brain, the shorter will be the incubation period, right? So it's possible that because the rabies virus first replicates where they're inoculated, and then slowly they're going to make their way into the central nervous system and to the brain, it might be because of this slow movement from the site of infection to the central nervous system. That's why these post-exposure vaccinations work. And the reason this is important, you guys, is we still do that today, right? If you or family or friend is bitten by a rabbit animal, you go and you get, you start your rabies vaccinations, right? To ensure that you won't, you won't develop this, the clinical sign of the central nervous system. Yeah, okay. So folks, why did I talk about this? Because remember, this was, this was the process that Pasteur used to weaken these rabies viruses. They were, they were still infectious. They could still replicate in the person you vaccinate because, because we want to trigger an immune response, right? Um, but they, they, they would not kill. And actually, I have to be really careful here in case. Um, I, think, I think Pasteur actually killed the viruses before he did inoculate the children, okay? But if we back up here, you guys, to the, um, the varicella zoster vaccines, the chicken pox and shingles vaccines, those are weakened viruses, but they are still alive, meaning they're going to replicate inside you, right, to trigger that immune response. So this is awesome, you guys. Live attenuated um, vaccines are the best. They're the best at triggering a really strong immune response. They're best at triggering memory cells. And we're going to be talking a lot about memory cells, right? But there's a problem. And the problem is, folks, do you think if you vaccinate somebody that has a weakened immune system with a live attenuated virus vaccine, is it possible the vaccine virus itself could cause harm? Yes, it is. Right, so there's two things we want to think about. If, if we have a vaccine for a patient, we need to ask, um, is their immune system strong, functioning, right? Because they have to have a you know, strong immune system. And you guys, the other thing that's so important is that if you get vaccinated, right, with one of these live attenuated virus vaccines, is the virus replicating? Are you shedding virus? So if you came in contact with somebody severely immunocompromised, could you be a source of the vaccine virus that could infect them and cause serious harm in them? Yeah. And folks, this was, this was something, when I got the shingles vaccine, I'm not sure they told me, make sure that you stay away from anybody that's immunocompromised, stay away from the you know, little, little babies, right? Because you don't want them to get infected. I'm not sure they reminded me of that. So that's something that we, we, you know, we need to educate our patients. And furthermore, you guys, and I'm sure if you're working in a medical hospital, um, working in a hospital or medical office, um, you would want to be really careful that you don't come in contact with immunocompromised patients, right? Because again, you're fine, but you're shedding the vaccine virus, and that could infect your immunocompromised patients and cause them serious harm, right? So I was like, wow, that's kind of important that we educate people about that. So this table, you guys, I don't, don't, you don't have to um, memorize this. I, I just thought this was really interesting. So the contraindications for the live uh, attenuated virus vaccines, you guys, if you have, for example, a person that has HIV and they've progressed to AIDS, right? In AIDS, there's a collapse of the immune system. So you would want to vac vaccinate your HIV AIDS patients with a live attenuated virus vaccine. You would use a killed vaccine or what's called a subunit vaccine, something that would not um, have the potential to cause infection. And then folks in cancers, so blood cancers, um, solid tumor cancers, you would want to give a live attenuated vaccines during chemotherapy, right? Um, bone marrow transplants, the same thing. You've got to be careful um, with your bone marrow transplant recipients. I, 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 trans, transplant recipients in general, folks, it makes sense. Often they're on lifelong immunosuppressive therapy, right? So they won't reject the transplanted organ. Um, people that are on immunosuppressive therapy for autoimmune diseases, right, have to be really careful for them. And with um, asplenia, this often happens, you guys, is with little kids, if they take a fall, they might rupture their spleen, so the spleen gets removed. And you could actually consider they are somewhat 
um, immunocompromised. And so this is something that um, I'm not, with this table, I'll have, to, I'll have to check out the original article you guys, I was a little bit confused here. They were saying that in people that don't have a spleen, it, are, are the attenuated uh, live viruses contraindicated? So I, I, I'm a little bit confused by this table because they're saying you should, you know, make sure you vaccinate, but maybe make sure when you vaccinate you're not using the live attenuated virus vaccines, yeah. So that's another one that often I forget about. If you don't have a spleen, that lowers your um, your defenses. Yeah. Okay. And then the last topic you guys were going to talk about, and I know at first this might sound kind of like a downer, kind of a bummer, um, but there's really good news here. We are we are aware that with some latent viral infections, like we get infected, we re we remain infected for life. Some of those viruses, some specific strains, may increase our risk of cancer. So, you guys, so what would we call what would we call a virus that can increase our risk of cancer? Oncogenic. Good, you guys. Oncogenic viruses. So, um, the oncogenic viruses I'd like you to know are the, the these first two groups. You guys, you don't have to worry about the Epstein Barr virus. But for the exam, you guys, if you could remember that um, hepatitis B virus and hepatitis C virus um, in chronic infections, they can increase the risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, right? Um, and, then, and then folks with human papilloma virus, remember you guys, there's, there's, I think there's over like 100 strains of human papilloma virus. So most of the strains are not oncogenic. It's like specific strains are oncogenic. And the ones, the strains I'd like you guys to know, because they're highly oncogenic, are the HPV strains 16 and 18. These are ones that, if our cells become latently infected, they have a great chance of causing those cells to lose control of how they replicate, become cancer cells. So I think the, the studies have shown that in cervical cancer cells, I think like 80% or more of the cervical cancer cells have either HPV 16 or 18, DNA in them, really suggesting it was that infection that triggered the cells to become cancerous. And furthermore, folks, with these oncogenic strains, they can cause cervical cancer, they can cause anal rectal cancer, they can cause cancer of the penis. A lot of times men think they, you know, it's like, oh, that's a woman's name, but it's not, right? They can, ca they can cause cancer of the, the uh, penis. And very importantly, you guys, and again, this is part of um, educating your patients. If your patients, um, and we probably already did this, I apologize. Just be, you know, make sure that you educate your patients that if they are um, practicing oral sex, that pathogens from the genital tract can be transferred to the throat, right? And they're seeing a big increase in throat esophageal cancers caused by the oncogenic strains of HPV. And the concern is people aren't aware that you can have transmission of these cancer-causing pathogens. Um, and again, it's just education, you guys, right? Uh, you know, education is power. Um, just want to make sure that we're encouraging safe sex, right? And, but, but you guys, the good news is, I mean, there's finally some good news, and that is we have vaccines to protect against some of these. So the good news is, folks, we now have a vaccine to protect against hepatitis B. That's a vaccine to prevent cancer. Isn't that what we've been looking for, right? Vaccines to prevent cancer. So you could argue that if you get your kids vaccinated with the hepatitis B vaccine, you're reducing their chance of sometime in the future maybe you know, um, developing um, liver cancer. Um, likewise, you guys, with the HPV strain 16 and 18, there's at least two vaccines that we can use to vaccinate our children to prevent their infection with those oncogenic strains. So again, you guys, you could argue, wow, we have a vaccine to prevent or reduce cervical cancer, anal rectal cancer, cancer of the penis, cancers of the throats, right? So, so often in micro, I, I just feel like, oh my God, I'm just delivering all this bad news. But this is truly awesome news, you guys. This is really, really wonderful news. And we can just hope that they will continue um, finding the technology, right? to develop more vaccines against a lot of the, our, the common, serious, latent, oncogenic uh, viral strains. Yeah, so this is, good, I think, good news.
All right. So, folks, I, and again, I, I am not trying to be funny. Were there, did you have questions? Maybe if you had a chance to look at some of the virus information. Did you have questions that came up or anything that we've talked about today? Any virus questions I might be able to, to answer? Okay. All right. So, folks, what we're going to do then is we're just going to take a look at a couple of RNA viruses, right? So, um, if I can find, if I can find our, okay, so you guys, so this would be our viruses part two, and we're just going to look at a couple RNA viruses. And again, folks, I probably mentioned earlier, I think with HIV, what I'll do is make a worksheet on HIV infections and treatment and um, the, any extra information on HIV AIDS that's on the worksheet, that would be just bonus questions on lecture exam three. I would like you to know that HIV is an RNA virus. It's an envelope virus. I would like you to know that it carries out the incredible process of reverse transcription and you guys, what's the name of the HIV enzyme that carries out reverse transcription? HIV reverse transcriptase, right? And I would like you, I would like you to know that in step one of reverse transcription, the HIV reverse transcriptase acts as an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, right? That, remember, that was just like blowing us out of the water. It's like, that's crazy, right? How can an enzyme do that? Okay, so that would be fair game because we talked about those, those little topics of HIV in our introduction. But again, you guys, any additional information that you will find on the HIV worksheet, which I'll try to get to you on Thursday, those would be bonus questions on lecture exam three. Okay, all right. So then, folks, what we're going to do is, again, we're just going to take a look at um, using the second PowerPoint, influenza and polio virus. I think those are the two we're going to take a look at. Okay, so we'll just switch here. So um, influenza virus and polio virus, folks, they're RNA viruses. So right off the bat, we're a little bit suspicious they could have what? They could have the potential for high mutation rates, right, compared to DNA viruses. And why is that? You guys, if it was a short answer question, and I asked you, why is it that RNA viruses have higher mutation rates? To, good, good. So you want to you state that to replicate the viral RNA, which enzymes are used? RNA polymerases, right? And do RNA polymerases proofread? Nope. So you guys remember roughly one mistake, one mutation in every 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 5th nucleotides, that's an incredibly high mutation rate, right? And people argue, well, that's such a high mutation rate, wouldn't most of the mutations um, um, be lethal, quote unquote, for the virus? But you guys, they're replicating at such a high rate, you could argue that 99.9% .9 of the viruses, they might have a lethal mutation, but if you have 0.1% of them, that are infectious, right, and maybe have evolved drug resistance, right, or maybe are outwitting the immune system, that's a huge advantage, yeah. And folks, again, do you have to remember all the families of RNA viruses? Mm -hmm. Nope, nope. We just wanted to remember that there's more than twice as many RNA virus families as DNA viruses, and again, just emphasizing their incredible t potential to generate um, genetic variation. And again, you guys, that remains a challenge for us because they can rapidly evolve antiviral drug um, resistance, right? They can outwit our immune system, right? So we might have an effective immune response against one variant, but if we get infected with a second variant, uh, the immune system might not be able to um, eliminate that variant. And it also makes it really challenging to develop um, vaccines, right? That's, that's the problem with HIV. It mutates so rapidly, we, we, we don't have the technology or the understanding yet to develop an anti-HIV vaccine that will protect us against all the different variants out there, right? We really need that, that understanding. All right, folks, so um, the, um, the, the virus we'll probably spend most of our time on, folks, is the influenza virus. And the reason for this is, a few years ago, um, 
Um, another micro instructor and I visited the state public health um, diagnostic lab down in Vallejo. And one of the things we were really interested in is like, what should we as a public be most afraid of, right, with regard to infectious disease? And I thought it was going to be like Ebola, you know, some dramatic. And they're like, it's influenza virus. This is the one that we think has the potential to kill millions of us, right? And so we want to explore what you know, influenza, you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it should be that lethal, right? Why, why should we be worried about influenza? So influenza virus, and, and remember folks that at one time before invention of um, electron microscopes, um, there would be these horrible epidemics of influenza and nobody knew it was causing it. And indeed historically some people thought it had to do with the influence of the misalignment of the stars and the planets, right? So the influence, right, of the stars, planets being misaligned, right? And how horrible to have these epidemics you know, sweep through your community, you have no idea what was causing it, yeah. Okay, so it is an envelope RNA virus. So that's good news, folks. Why is being enveloped good news? Right, that's, that's, that's really important, folks, because we know with envelope viruses, where are their adhesions? In the envelope, right? And is that envelope tough and strong and resistant? No, it's like the consistency of olive oil, right? It's stolen host cell membrane. So once we shed an influenza virus into the environment, just if the virus dries, right, that's probably going to damage the envelope and they're no longer infectious, right? They're sensitive to soaps and alcohols. So that's good news. But the bad news is, you guys, is that we're going to discover when we start talking about bird influenza or avian influenza, we're going to see in birds the um, influenza viruses replicate in their intestines. So where will we find lots of avian influenza viruses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, just as an aside, you guys, there's been studies that have shown in moist bird feces the bird, or the fancy term you guys for bird, is avian influenza viruses remain infectious for up to three months. And we'll come back to this, folks, because we'll talk about some highly virulent strains of avian influenza, um, which can cause really high mortality rates in humans. And so we need to be aware that if those highly virulent avian influenza strains make it to California, and there's a good chance we'd be one of the first places they would arrive, that if we're out with our children, you know, in the park, and a lot of times you take your kids to the park to feed the, the ducks and the geese, right? And when you're walking around, you guys, what are you walking through? Lots of bird poop, right? So we just need to be aware that although um, influenza viruses are enveloped, if, if they're shed in moist organic material like feces, the feces remains moist, like through the winter, right here in California, if we ever get rain, they can remain infectious for almost three months. So that means the feces, right, could be a source of infection, say, for your children. Or if you have family or friends that are duck or goose hunters, right, Right? When they're butchering the carcass, be careful of the feces, right? And all the other secretions of the bird. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. so then, um, furthermore, folks, in the influenza viruses, it turns out that there are three groups. <coughs> so we have group A, B, and C. So we'll, we'll start with C's, you guys. These have really low virulence for humans. They're, they're human adapted. They have low virulence in humans. And we're so not worried about them, they aren't even included in our annual influenza vaccine. You know, you, you might think you have a cold maybe when you get them, right? Now the type um, B influenza viruses, these infect humans only. And they may be virulent, may be virulent in humans. And virulent is just like a measure of damage. So we could say they could cause serious disease, serious harm in humans. 
And consequently, folks, usually in the annual influenza vaccine, they usually include at least one type B. Okay. Okay, so they're going to be included in the annual influenza vaccine. Now, folks, the rest of our discussion is going to be on the group A influenza viruses or type A influenza viruses. These are the ones we are very worried about. So a little of their natural history, um, these um, can infect animals. And, and an example, you guys, is, for example, birds and pigs. These are two really important animal hosts. Um, they can infect animals and humans. So you guys, if we have a strain of, um, of uh, uh, type or group A influenza, uh, and let's say, let's, let's use the duck example, you guys. Let's say we have a duck that has an avian influenza virus, and maybe we're handling the duck, or we step in the duck feces, right? And we get infected, right? What do we call pathogens that can be transmitted from a non-human Host to us, we're called zoonotic, right? So we're really worried because these they may be zoonotic, right? We can we can get them not only from another human, we could get them from non-human animals, and they can be highly virulent. So, for example, folks, in some of the avian influenza strains that infect human, the mortality rate is like 33%. So out of every 100 people that gets infected, how many die? Yeah, yeah. So for example, in some of the um, virulent avian influenza, and we'll be talking about this strain, you guys, is pretty famous, the H5N1. Oops. H5N1 avian influenza. Human mortality is around 30 33%. Like a third of the people that get infected die. That's really high mortality. Yeah. So we'll see, you know, this is one of the reasons, you guys, that the public health um, folks are so worried about influenza. You know, pathogens that can kill a third of the people they infect. Who's, who's going to get infected? Who will be some of the first people, you guys, that get infected? The health. Yeah, yeah good. That's good, you guys. But who else? Our, our, our soldiers in the trenches, our healthcare providers, right? So if the healthcare provider, if a third of them die, right, who's gonna take care of the rest of us, right? So this has great potential to cause absolutely horrific epidemics, yeah? Okay, so I hope most of you guys have gotten your influenza vaccine. Well, as soon as they offer them at Target, I go there, I'll pay for it, you know? I, got, I get it as soon as I can, right? And, and again, you and get folks, especially those of you that are going to be working around, you know, people that, that are sick or immunocompromised, it's going to be really important that you don't act as a source, right, of these pathogens. So again, you guys, I just can't plug vaccination enough. All right. So folks, we're going to focus then on our uh, group A influenza viruses. And as always, you guys, we always want to look at structure. We need to understand structure to understand replication. And by understanding replication, maybe we can figure out a way to, um, to stop their spread, stop the replication, either using vaccinations or by using antiviral drugs. Okay, so that's why structure, function, replication, drugs, and vaccines, they all kind of go together here. Okay. So you guys, we'll do a little cartoon of a generic influenza A virus. Let me we'll do the A's. All right, you guys. So we know right off the bat, right, we're probably in trouble because of an RNA virus. So they're going to have a really high mutation rate. Okay. And then, folks, we'll take we'll take a look at the structure. So we'll work from the outside in. Okay, folks. And this is very simplified. Okay. So this is our are going to be our our group A. So, folks, we know that they have an envelope. And, folks, where did that envelope come from? Yeah, from our, our cell membranes, right? So this is the stolen host cell membrane. And then, folks, the, um, 
the genetic information is absolutely fascinating. So it turns out that the group A influenza viruses, their viral RNA comes in eight little segments, and they're like little mini chromosomes, meaning that there's different genes for different proteins on the different RNA segments. Okay, so let me just put the eight little segments here, two, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, so there's um, the viral genome equals eight RNA segments, right? And each of the RNA segments, they're carrying different genes, and this will become important, right? And this was a little bit hard to describe, you guys, but if, if I were to draw a capsid, so um, each of the little RNA strands has a helical capsid around it, right? So to me, that was always hard to, it was always hard to cartoon or imagine because I'm used to like those icosahedral capsids. But again, folks, in the influenza virus, there's a helical protein capsid around each of the RNA segments. Okay, so we'll just put, oh, okay. So we'll just put like a little capsid, a helical capsule, capsid around these. And the helical capsid is not that big a deal, you guys. So we'll just put it in here. And there's, addition, there's additional proteins, you guys, but we're trying to keep this simple. Okay, so the black, I'll just do this, equals the um, protein capsid protects the RNA segments. Okay. All right, you guys. So, but I'm missing something really, really important in my envelope. What do we, what do we know the viruses do? If they're going to steal our cell membranes, and if the cell membrane becomes our envelope, what must the virus do? How does it modify the cell membrane that's going to be stolen? Yeah, exactly. Going to insert some adhesins, right? Okay, so I'm going to put, I'm not going to follow your cartoon. I'm going, to, I'm going to put it like this, you guys. So there's going to be two envelope proteins that are going to be important in how the influenza virus replicates. So this lollipop looking thing, you guys, I'm going to call that my hemagglutinin. And it turns out the hemagglutinins are the influenza adhesin. So this, it's called the hemagglutinin. Am I spelling that right? Yeah, hemagglutinin. This is viral protein. And just the, the history of this, you guys, hemagglutinin literally means blood clumping. So the reason it was called this is that when the early studies on influenza viruses were being carried out, they discovered that if you mix influenza virus with red blood cells, it causes the red blood cells to clump together. And it's because the influenza virus binds to um, surface receptors on the red blood cells. And so the viruses end up cross-linking the red blood cells, and that's why you get this red blood cell clumping, right? So hemagglutinin. That's not our interest, you guys. Our interest in the hemagglutinin is it is the adhesin. What's an adhesin, folks? Yeah, I think of adhesive tape, right? It's a structure that's going to bind to very specific host cell surface receptors in the first step, attachment or absorption. And you guys, if, if I, I get a lousy cartoon here, you guys, but if And we're going to focus on the host cell surface receptors. So let's pretend this is our host cell right here. Okay, so this is the host cell. We're, we always, if we can, we want to find out what's the receptor? What are they binding to, right? So you guys, the host cell surface receptor here, I'll put these little cups, is called sialic acid. So these little blue cups, are the host cell surface receptors and the host cell surface receptor, you guys, is called sialic acid. Now, just for the back burner, you guys, it turns out there's all different flavors of sialic acid. I like to think of them as being ice cream, right? So there's many different flavors of sialic acid. And later, this is going to become important because we're going to we're going to discover that the hemagglutinins are pretty specific as to which sialic acid they'll bind to, right? And this is going to help us understand why is it that some influenza viruses in humans are highly contagious but usually don't kill us, 
In contrast, why is it that some um, um, influenza viruses like that horrible H5N1, why is it that when humans get infected, they have such incredibly high death rates, but the good news is rarely are they contagious between humans, and it's going to have to do with the sialic acid receptors and the hemagglutinin, so we're going to come back to this, you guys. There's one last influenza protein in the envelope I'd like you guys to know, and it's called neuraminidase. What shall I do here? Let me use red here, okay? So you guys, I'm just going to use little red spikes here, and this is another Influ influenza virus envelope protein, and it's called neuraminidase. And we're going to see that, um, that neuraminidase it might play two roles. One, in helping influenza viruses hydrolyze their way through thick mucus blankets, protecting, say, our respiratory epithelial cells. And for sure, you guys, it plays an important role um, helping influenza viruses escape from the host cell they've just been released from. So we'll come back and talk more about um, neuraminidase later. Now, folks, both the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase are made of proteins, right? So if we talk about influenza antigens, and, and remember, folks, antigens are substances which our immune system sees as foreign. They're substances that are, that are going to trigger an immune response from us. For example, antibody production. The two really important influenza antigens I'd like you guys to know are the H antigen and the N antigen. So you guys, what do you think H stands for? Yeah. So here's our H antigen. That in here. This is the H antigen. And what do you think the N antigen is? The neuraminidase. Good. And folks, let's just take the H antigen. Let's say that you got infected with an influenza virus, right? Your immune system recognized it as foreign, and your immune system made antibodies against the H antigen. Why would that be helpful? Why would antibodies, why would antibodies, okay, let's pretend this is our influenza virus, right? Let's pretend this is our influenza virus, influenza virus right here. And you guys, these guys are what? Hemagglutinin, right? And you guys, on our host cell here, what are the green puffballs? Sialic acid receptors. So you guys, so if my hand represents an antibody, if my immune system makes antibodies against the H antigens, why would binding of the H antigens to the hemagglutinin be helpful? Block attachment, right? Yeah? And you guys, what do we call antibodies which block attachment? Awesome. Neutralizing antibodies. Awesome, you guys. Excellent. Okay. So how can we squeeze this in here? Okay. So um, antibodies which bind the H antigen will block, we'll pretend it's an exam question, you guys, will block, fill in the blank. Will block attachment, right? Will block attachment of the virus to the host cell. And again, you guys, what do we call antibodies which block attachment? Neutralizing antibodies. Right. So you guys, if you were trying to develop, if you were trying to develop a vaccine, would your goal be that the vaccine, when injected into your patients, triggers production of really high levels of neutralizing antibodies? Would that be a goal of your vaccine? Yes, absolutely, you guys. So that is a goal of vaccines, is you want to try to trigger production of protective neutralizing antibodies. Good job, you guys. Neutralizing antibodies block what? Good. Excellent, you guys. Excellent. And we're going to see that, that 
strategy over and over and over again when we start talking about vaccines. Good, good, you guys. So folks, does it make sense that like when I got my influenza vaccine, probably what, maybe like six weeks ago, there were three different influenza viruses in it. Do you think, or I hope, do you think I have neutralizing antibodies against all three different H antigens or on all those three different influenza virus? Yeah, that, I'm hoping, right? I'm hoping, because that's what will, what will um, prevent me becoming infected with those three, three strains of influenza virus. I've got high circulating um, antibodies against them. I'm hoping I've got antibody in my mucus secretions, right? And we'll talk about secretary IgA, right? So I'm hoping if I inhale one of those influenza viruses, my antibodies will bind to the H antigens, and then the influenza can't bind to my cells. Right? Can it cause infection if it can't bind? Nope. That's it, right? Yeah. Wait, Crystal, did you have a comment? Kind of. Um, okay. I think you might have answered it. I was going to ask, um, so once the antibodies were bind onto the virus, yes. then it was just, the antibodies would then just... Yeah. Okay. yeah, so, right, so if, um, and we'll talk about these are great. So you guys, um, ideally in that thick mucus blanket, if you have antibodies, neutralizing antibodies in the thick mucus blanket, your secretary IgA, they bind to the virus, and then there's a component of secretary IgA that binds it to the mucus blanket. So if it was, if it was the mucociliary, you know, escalator here, the viruses get bound into the mucus blanket, the cilia beat it up to the back of your throat. You, you, you can swallow it and destroy it or spit it out, right? Or um, in viruses, if you coat them with antibody, then just like you said, they're going to be easily phagocytized and destroyed by your phagocytic cells. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks, so that was a lot. I mean, that's a lot. So you guys, what's the H antigen of influenza virus? The hemagglutinin, what's its function? To bind to host cell surface receptors. What are the host cell surface receptors of influenza viruses? Sialic acid, good job, you guys. All right, um, if you have antibodies against the H antigen, we would call them what kind of antibodies? Neutralizing, awesome, you guys. Will um, effective vaccines against influenza viruses trigger production of neutralizing antibodies? Yes, yes good. You, you just got 100% on that. Good. Okay. Now it's going to get a little bit messier, you guys. So, um, did I finish that? Okay. All righty. So, folks, uh, um, again, we're kind of exploring why are the public health folks so uptight about influenza viruses, right? Well, gosh. So, folks, it turns out there's many different H antigens and there's many different N antigens. And if you think of it, you guys, the H antigen, the N antigens, they're proteins, right? So they're made of chains of amino acids encoded by, and I'll just put this in here, folks. So the gene for the hemagglutinin, hemagglutinin we'll just put the, the, uh, the H gene on one, fragment of DNA, or excuse me, RNA, folks, and then the neuraminidase is going to be on another one. So when RNA polymerase is copying that RNA, will it make a lot of mistakes? Yes, yes right? So eventually, when that, when that mutant RNA is translated, you think we're going to end up with variation in the amino acid sequence? Yeah. yeah. And so you guys, we get this great diversity of H and N antigens, right? So there's, at the very least, let me see here. Let me, let me go forward when you guys, and I apologize for this. Let me go forward to my favorite slide. Yeah, okay. So amongst H antigens in nature, folks, amongst the group A, there, I think there's even more now. So there's at least 15 different H antigens circulating out there in nature. And the same is true, folks, for the N antigens. Out in nature, there's nine or more different N antigens cir circulating out there in nature. So you're like, well, yeah, who cares, right? So this is a problem because, folks, what, what happens if, so if, if there's uh, more than or, e or equal to 15 different H antigens, right? And if there are equal to or more than nine different N antigens, let's just come up with a scenario, you guys. So let's say in 2019, you get infected with an H1 influenza virus, okay? So you're going to make antibodies against the H1 adhesin, right? 
So in theory, you would argue you should be protected from next year getting infected by that same H1. Does that make sense? But you guys, what happens in 2020, you get infected with an H5 influenza. Will your neutralizing antibodies against the H1 protect you against the H5 influenza? No, right? So are you going to get infected? Yes, you are. Right? So folks, can we see that because there's such diversity of H antigens out there, this means you can get vaccinated or infected with one influenza strain and in the future get infected by a different strain. Does that make sense? You're like, of course it does. It does make sense, right? And we'll see, folks, although the oh, nine different nine antigens. Okay. We'll see, folks, that the, the, um, the anti-antigen, it doesn't get as much press as the H antigen. But indeed, we'll see that antibodies against the N antigen can also provide some protection. But the one we'll focus on primarily is the, is the H1, because that's, again, going to trigger neutralizing antibodies. Yeah? So how do you predict what's changing the H1? Oh, the yeah. Theory? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's so good. So it is, it is tough. And let's just dive in there for right now, you guys. So um, before I do that, let me back up just a little bit. Let me back up one slide, you guys. So it turns out when, um, when you discover a new group A influenza virus, you ask what's the H antigen and what's the N antigen. So they have all the different varieties they've been given numbers, right? So for example, you guys, maybe one year you were infected by an H1N1, right? Right? You develop antibodies, right? But the next year now you're infected by an H2N3, right? Not, not protected, right? So we want to know that it's always this combination of H and N. So, folks, the problem with our inactivated influenza vaccine is they're grown in duck eggs. Now, and the problem is not all the viruses grow really well in duck eggs. So to make enough vaccine to, say, vaccinate the population in the United States, the people have to start six months in advance, half a year in advance, right? So who, who knows what the vaccine, what, excuse me, who knows which viruses will be circulating? So they do two things. They look at the last influenza season, right, say, say for the United States, and they'll decide should we include, you know, a couple of the same viruses, right, from last year and this year in case it's still circulating. And then the second thing they'll do is they're going to look in the southern hemisphere. They'll say which influenza viruses are causing epidemics, in the southern hemisphere, like Australia, because because you guys, the northern and southern hemisphere, our seasons are flipped, right? We're going into winter, they're going into summer now. And influenza season is usually winter. So they will ask which influenza strains have been circulating in the su southern hemisphere, knowing that those viruses can move north. So they have to guess, you guys. It's totally a guess. And they have to guess six months in advance. So some, some years they're lucky, and some years they aren't. So that's why sometimes people will say, well, I got vaccinated with the influenza vaccine, and still I got really sick, right? It might be that year the guess, the combination of influenza virus, just missed it totally, right? For me, you guys, since I'm, I'm a big vaccine advocate, my thought is, and I'm older, right? My idea is I'm, I'm going to get vaccinated every year. And I'm hoping that I've had enough exposure, maybe enough memory cells, right, that I'm building up like a bank of memory cells that at least would prevent me from dying from a really serious influenza um, strain. That's my hope, is I'm building up memory cells that will protect me against a, a wide range of viruses. Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, what we need with regard to technology is a way to make influenza vaccines much more rapidly, right? So we wait and find out what's the strain causing the epidemics, and now we'll make the vaccine against it. But we're still a little bit slow on that, but excellent, excellent. Um, and you guys, um, could I ask that on the lecture exam three? Like, how long does it take to, to um, grow enough influenza viruses for the vaccine? Yeah, and what is it, you guys? Six months, right? Um, how are they grown? Embryonated eggs, duck eggs, you guys. So do you always want to ask your patient if you're inoculating one of those inactivated um, vaccines if they're allergic to eggs? Yeah, because that could be important. You don't want to throw them into uh, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, right? And you guys, there's, there's other vaccines that are available. It's just that 
the duck grown um, inactivated ones are the ones most commonly given by injection. Yeah, good, good questions, you guys. Okay. So, folks, just, and again, you guys try to throw things at me because um, one of the instructors, and, and she was totally right, got really upset because last week I was getting out of the lecture hall so late, and then that was making her late. So, you guys yell at me, throw things at me at like quarter till. I need to start closing up shop five minutes earlier, which I know you guys will agree with because you're exhausted anyway. Okay, but just, just so we know. Okay, so you guys, um, because I want to make sure we get some of these key concepts in here. Um, so folks, amongst the group A's, um, it's not only the diversity of H and N antigens, it's the fact that we constantly have this mutation going on, this background level of mutation, right? Every time the RNA is copied, there's going to be mistakes, mutations. And folks, those those changes that accumulate through mistakes made by RNA polymerase, they're described as antigenic drift. These are little changes in the amino acid sequence of the um, H and N antigen. And it's thought that those, the accumulation of those little changes, that antigen, antigenic drift, is responsible for local epidemics every maybe two to three years. Like, oh, I have a little local epidemic, right? The phenomenon, I think, the public health folks are so worried about you guys, is much more dramatic. And this change is called antigenic shift. And antigenic shift, folks, and I should be writing this on the board, because these are really important concepts, you guys. So when we look at generation, generation of genetic diversity and influenza virus. So if I ask a short answer question, you guys, um, what causes uh, genetic diversity in influenza viruses? And I'm looking for two reasons, you guys. So what's the first one? The first one we're pretty comfortable with. What's the first one? Gen gen yeah, good, good job, you guys. And, and you want to learn the term, it's called genetic drift. And what's genetic drift, you guys? Small changes, yeah, in the amino acid sequence of, of the amino acid sequence of the H and N antigens caused by what, folks, help me out? Caused by what's causing those mutations caused by yeah yeah mistakes caused by yeah thank you guys so caused by mistakes mistakes made by RNA polymerase oh my god this is not a short answer replicating the influenza RNA. Oh my goodness. All right. So you guys, so we're pretty comfortable with that, right? We've been talking about this a lot. It's this next phenomenon, you guys, that's really scary for us humans. And this next phenomenon, you guys, is called genetic shift. And this is really scary. It's called recombination or reassortment. And what is scary about it, folks, is that two different strains of influenza virus can infect the same host. So two different strains of influenza virus can infect the same host. And you guys, I'm going to make this up. So let's say, I'm going to, I'm going to totally make this up. Okay. Let's say that, that this is a bird. This is avian influenza. And we'll make it an H1, H1N5 strain, okay? And you guys, we're going to discover pigs, pig, poor pigs, they get infected a lot. So, and then we can have a, a swine influenza. And I'm totally making this one up, you guys, so just making this one up. I, I'm going to make it up, an H3N4, all right? So, let's say you got a farmer. A farmer and he's taking care of his birds and he's taking care of his pigs and so these are zoonotic strains you guys so the farmer could the farmer become co-infected with both of these strains yeah co-infected means infected with this at the same time right so the farmer is co-infected with the avian 
and, and the pig. And folks, what makes this wild is that a single cell can be co-infected. So like a single respiratory epithelial cell in your body could get co-infected with two different strains. So, so what's wild about this, you guys, is when the influenza virus is replicating sugar. So let's say that one human cell is co-infected with the, the H1, oh I, I did that wrong, you guys, sorry, I'm getting too excited. The avian influenza, well, let's make it the really nasty one, the H5N1. H5N1 and uh, our make believe swine N4, okay? In, in that human cell, this is the human cell, right? So let's make the, the H5 RNA, H5, um, N1 RNA in blue. So you're going to have H5, these are the RNA strands you guys are getting replicated. So the RNA, right? And then let's make the H3N4 RNA in red. So we'll have some H3, some N4s, H3N4. Okay. Okay, so again, this is RNA. So you okay, guys, so after all the RNAs have been replicated, after biosynthesis is complete, right? The proteins have been made, the RNA has been copied. What's the next step? Assembly, right? Yeah? And you guys, it's totally random which RNA strands go into the newly replicated viruses. So what will be, what will be um, the H and, H and N possibilities of the new viruses? Okay, well, can you have mom and dad type combinations? Yeah, you can, right? So you can have an H5N1 and, and the other parental one, right, you guys, H3N4. But are you going to have some brand new combinations? Yeah. Yes. And what would those combinations be? An H5N4, right? So we could have H5, and I'll try to color code them here, N4. And what's the other combination, you guys, new combination? H3N1. Awesome. So you have an H3 and N1. So you guys, these are brand new combinations. Brand new combinations of H and N antigens. And it's possible, like, the human immune system has never seen these combinations before. So it's these newly reassorted viruses that may be newly reassorted viruses may be highly fatal, may be highly fatal to humans. And I think, you guys, this is, this is, this is like, again, kind of a made-up example, but this is an example of this incredible process known as antigenic shift. Oh, gosh, and you guys, I'm so bad. I think I need, I think I need, a week's vacation here. You guys, I, I am so apologize. On the board here, I got carried away. It said genetic drift and genetic shift. That was incorrect. On the exam, how would you correct it? Antigenic. I'm so sorry, folks. Antigenic drift and antigenic. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. So antigenic drift, you guys. And what did we just describe here? That's antigenic shift. And you guys are going to laugh at me. Because to me, it's like, gosh, drift and shift. That sounds so similar. How do I keep them straight in my mind? So you guys, I think of drift as like driftwood, like maybe on the ocean. And the driftwood is changing positions really slowly, really slowly drifting along. Really slow amino acid changes. Little mutations, right? But in the old days, you guys, when we used to type with typewriters, 
there was a shift, right, where you came to the end of the line and then you'd shift the typewriter and you'd have these big changes in the position of your page. So I think of antigenic shift as big changes, like shift, 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 big changes, new combinations of H and N antigens. And again, folks, I think it's the antigenic shift that the public health people are so worried about that we could come up with brand new combinations of H and N antigens against which the, the humans is a huge worldwide family. We have no immunity, no protection against. Okay, so you guys will stop there. And what we'll do on Thursday, you guys, is we'll take a look, uh, do a little bit more on different hosts of influenza viruses. And we'll take a look at a couple of the more recent um, zoonotic outbreaks of influenza viruses in humans. Okay, do a little bit of poliovirus. And then we'll do prions, okay? All right, you guys, take good care. No, I, I need you guys to eat it because I'm eating it all. Oh, okay. I sit in my office and I'm eating all of it. I need you guys to help me.